Hello YouTube, Ace here, and today I'd like to talk about the new Wonder Woman movie. So, I saw it in the theater the other day, and, uh, well, what are my thoughts, you might ask? Well, as a superhero film, I do like it. However, as some of you may know, the film is actually set in World War I, so when I first found out that it was going to be set in World War I, I was instantly extremely curious about it, and seeing how Hollywood was going to portray the war in a major film. And the thing is, at the end of the day, like I said, I like it as a superhero film. As a historical film, it has some problems. It has some pretty notable historical inaccuracies, which I'm going to get into uh, with this video here. Uh, there's three thing. there's four subjects I'm going to go over. Well, three in real, three actual subjects and one miscellaneous for just everything else. It's more minor stuff. But let's start off. Well, the first major thing I should talk about is the villain throughout most of the movie. And this is General Ludendorff, who is actually based off of a real person. In fact, the actual General Erich von Ludendorff was a key player in World War I, being in many ways the brains behind the German army towards the end of the war. I feel I should mention his rise to power first because it is a little bit interesting in his own right. Because his first claim to fame in World War I was helping to capture the key city of Liège during the first major battle of the First World War. Personally going up to the cathedral of the city, he personally captured over 200 Belgians while being alone. So that is quite an impressive feat in its own right. In addition to this, he also helped uh, join a General Paul von Hindenburg and played a key role there on the Eastern Front shortly after in the Battle of Tannenberg. In fact, both Paul von Hindenburg and Erich von Ludendorff would stick together for the vast majority of the war as a tag team duo, and one of the most effective tag team duos of the entire war when it came down to it. So, what are the issues that I have with his portrayal in the movie? Well, First, let's get the most minor details out of the way. The actual Eric von Ludendorff had a mustache, which the actor that plays him in the movie does not. And like I said, this is pretty much a nitpick issue in a lot of ways. The problem here is that uh, if they can't, if they didn't bother to get this right, I mean, this makeup is something that is pretty basic that you should be able to get right, even if your casting isn't perfect. The fact that the matter is that Ludendorff didn't have a mustache in the movie seems... It is petty, I'll give you that, but it's just a sign of bigger issues to come. One of the more bigger flaws is the fact that the movie takes place towards the very, very end of the war. Uh, the vast majority of it takes place in November of 1918. And this is an issue specifically because, by this point in the war, Erich von Ludendorff had resigned. In fact, he resigned, depending on whatever source you used, either October 27th or October 26th. The important thing to remember, though, is that Erich von Ludendorff was no longer a factor in the German army. So, when they have his character going around as a general still, right up to the right up to November 10th it is not actually historically accurate another thing is and I am going to go into spoilers here a bit but they kill off uh, the they kill off general Ludendorff at the end of the film they when historically he of course survived the war and would go on to live into the 1930s moving on from that another thing I should point out is one of the plot points is that Eric von Ludendorff wants to convince the Kaiser of continuing the war by showing him his new, well, special chemical weapon that he is help he and a doctor, who's, by the way, a fictional character called Dr. Poison, or nicknamed Dr. Poison in the movie, like I said, completely fictional character, has developed a new form of gas, and I will be getting on to that later on, but uh, Eric von Ludendorff basically tries to show the Kaiser on November 10th that this gas was going to be a win be a winning ticket for them with the war and the problem here is that kaiser wilhelm already abdicated his throne he was no longer in charge of germany now the kaiser abdicated on november 9th which okay that's a small detail but something else i should mention is that he didn't have the authority anyways because on october 28th 
he actually gave additional powers to uh, the, the German equivalent of Parliament, essentially. Meaning, including the ability to declare war and make peace, as well as a lot of other things. So his powers by that point were extremely limited as a leader anyways. So it would not have really mattered to convince the Kaiser of the possibility of continuing the war, not effectively. Now, this actually leads me on to another thing I feel I should point out that's a major flaw in the movie is with regards to the armistice. And there's a few issues with the armistice and how it's portrayed in this. Uh, probably the biggest issue of all is the fact that the Allies in the movie are, con or the Entente powers in the movie are content to, well, try to slow down their pace, to not upset the Germans and whatnot. That is the explanation in the movie. And this is about as backwards as you can get historically speaking. By October of 1918, the Allies were advancing just everywhere they possibly could for the most part. You saw massive gains in Belgium, where the Allies were at one point pushed back to the gates of Ypres for the most part. And by October of 1918, had managed to make it all the way to the Dutch border in the city of Ghent. They took this key ports of Ostend and Zeebrugge, which were the U-boat ports that the, U that the Germans were using up to that point. In fact, when I said that it couldn't be further from the truth that the and as backwards as you can get, I really do mean that because the Allies, if anything, were pushing as hard as they possibly could to try to force the Germans into a position where they couldn't actually they couldn't actually get decent terms. And that's something else about Ludendorff's character I feel I should go back to real quick. The movie portrays Ludendorff as a warmonger and all that, and and as also being extremely hard on his men, to the point that he ends up uh, killing German officers repeatedly throughout the film. Now, credit where credit's due, Ludendorff was admittedly pushing his men a little bit farther than he should uh, towards the end of the war as things were getting more and more desperate. Having him shoot a German officer in the face right there in front of his men because the German officer was voicing his concerns about the condition that his army was having to face in the war is completely ridiculous. And like I said though, Ludendorff had already resigned by this point anyways, but if we're going to go down to it, while Ludendorff was before he, right before he resigned against signing the armistice, the reason wasn't that he was against ending the war. He, in fact, himself said repeatedly, the war must be ended. The difference here is that he wanted it to be ended in a manner that Germany could still be able to negotiate in some form or other. This uh, was not what the Allies had in mind, of course, and therefore because he realized that the, uh, the British and the French and all that we're going to basically screw Germany over, which, to be fair, they did. And, and to be fair, it's not like the Germans wouldn't have done the same if the roles were reversed. I mean, they did that to Russia as well, but that's beside the point. The thing is, at the end of the day, Ludendorff originally did want a peace. He saw the necessity for a peace, but he was not willing to accept the sort of peace that the Allies were after, specifically. So he... Uh, before he resigned, was advocating fighting to the end to try to get some sort of uh, some sort of leverage on the Allies in a nutshell. So there is that. So moving on from the armistice signing and all that, uh, something else I feel I should mention is the big weapon that General Ludendorff is planning on using to try to basically keep the keep the war going in the movie and this was a and apparently he's making a new variant of mustard gas which uses hydrogen instead of sulfur now let's just get this out of the way that's from a chemical standpoint completely ridiculous what you're basically making at that point is hydrogen chloride which i'm not even going to get into detail on just how ridiculous that is however let's just suspend our Let's just go a little bit of suspension of disbelief and say that they actually made something that worked like mustard gas, but just used oxygen instead, and made the gas mask useless. Well, two things. First and foremost, 
The Germans already tried in 1916 to make a gas that actually specifically countered gas masks. It was called diphosgene. It was used, like I said, in May of 1960, in fact, against the French at Verdun, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the Allies were, of course, able to make countermeasures, so the, if the advantage that it gave the Germans was not permanent by any means. Secondly, mustard gas, the way it worked, while it was a good idea, of course, to have a gas mask on, you did not really, you did not at all want to get caught in a mustard gas without it. it. Even if you had one on, it still is not going to save you because that's just not how that works. Um, for start, mustard gas is not actually a gas, but a very, very fine liquid mist that, or at least that is how it's when, when it's released, and it, it. It doesn't just affect the lungs the way that chlorine does, or the eyes the way that chlorine does, although it will affect both of them pretty badly. It also affects exposed skin. So when, for instance, Wonder Woman manages to go into a cloud of it to look at the havoc that uh, the gas has caused on a village, it's completely ridiculous that she's going there and not getting affected in any way whatsoever, except for the fact that, well... The movie makes it quite evident and quite clear that she's actually a god. So, and can't actually be harmed by anything other than another god. So, there is that. Uh, at the end of the day, like I said, and there is another thing I feel I should mention about mustard gas as well. And that, there's two other things. First and foremost, mustard gas, like a lot of the gases in World War One, actually, had a delayed reaction. It could take up to a full day before you started to see the side effects of exposure which probably made it more of an issue because you could, in fact, get be exposed to it, not know that you're exposed to it, and make things worse for you because you don't know you're exposed to it. Uh, the other thing that I feel I should mention is that it tends to stick around for a while, and this is... So, for a get... And it can contaminate an area for a long time, for not only days or weeks or months, but sometimes it actually, some areas were so saturated with stuff, it took decades for it to clear out. And people were still getting blisters from just touching trees or something decades after the war. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of using this thing as an offensive weapon to sort of try to soften up the front line, as the movie suggests is part of what the Germans plan to do with it, because it's just completely ridiculous to use it in that way. It, the main strategic advantage of it, from the historical standpoint, one of the major, major strategic advantages that it provided was the fact that it simply just simply was an area denial weapon. You, enemy troops couldn't occupy that area because it was such contaminated with it, and you didn't even have to really have many troops in the region to defend against them either. So anyways, but yeah, like I said, made a major issue with uh, how the gas is portrayed in this film. Although, to be fair, not very many films can do that sort of thing right. Um, and now I think we should move on to the last thing, which is just some mis miscellaneous things. Uh, for a start, there's a scene where Wonder Woman goes over the top because she notices some civilians that are stuck in the Allied front trenches and a city has fallen to the Germans, and Germans are doing all sorts of nasty things to the civilians in that village, and these civilians fled that village, yada, yada, yada. First of all, what genius of an Entente officer thought it was a good idea to keep civilians on the front-line trench? There's a few reasons why this is an issue. One, it's... One, the civilians have to use cover and whatnot that deprives the soldiers that are on the front line that cover. Now, you could argue, well, they have, well, they've seen the front-line trenches, so they can give this information back to the Germans, yada, yada, yada. Okay, why do you have them at the front-line trenches where they are the closest to the German lines? If you think they're spies or something, just send them to a PW camp or refugee camp, whatever, and it, the problem would sort itself out in that regard. There's no reason to have them at the front-line trenches, at least from a historical standpoint. From a superhero standpoint, it makes sense. Oh, look, Wonder Woman is here to save women and children. Fine, okay. And see, that's what we're all... That's what ultimately boils down to. The problems that this movie has from a historical standpoint 
are the sort of things that you'd expect to happen in a superhero movie. So I guess that's the best way to look at it as far as I can tell. Uh, another issue is at the at early stages of the movie, the, you have the um, male lead who uh, s explains in backstory that he went uh, to the secret German base located in the Ottoman Empire, posing as a pilot. Well, okay, this is a bit of a nitpick issue, fair enough, but the planes that are showcased at the secret military base, which you would think would have all kinds of experimental equipment, are Eindeckers, which are an early war German plane, and if I remember correctly, the other planes that are showcased there are actually not even German or Central Powers planes. They're actually British aircraft, if I'm not much mistaken, with just German markings on them, which makes no sense. But, again, it's a superhero movie. And this is why I'm saying, as a superhero movie, it's fine. In fact, I would suggest seeing it as a superhero movie. It is, however, one of those films, again, that you have to turn your brain off for. And just experience it as a superhero movie rather than try to take it as a historical film. I made the mistake of going to this movie mainly because it's a World War I film and I wanted to see how they do World War I. That's a legitimate mistake for, on my part. I will grant you that. So, looking at it from a superhero movie again, yeah, okay. It's a decent film, enough film to watch, okay? So that's ultimately all I have to say about that. Uh, hope to see you guys again soon. Take care. Ace out.